So I'm sure you don't want to hear me ramble. You'd much rather, so are we good with recording? All right. Um, since we're going to have a short amount of time for these lightning rounds, I'm sure you don't want to hear me ramble anymore. You'd rather see uh, Christian talk about post-quantum crypto. So please give a warm Shmukon welcome to Christian. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, let me, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, able to talk to you about something very special, the quantum hacker, which is uh, not something we hear very often. And also, these guys are a little bit special because I like to refer to them as uh, hacker gnomes. And we'll be able to see why in a few seconds. So I don't know if you uh, guys remember just about 20 years ago, the South Park episode where there were some very nefarious gnomes who were stealing people's underpants and somehow hoping to make a profit out of it. Turn, turns out it's not a great business to be in. And, uh, well, okay, we'll see what happened to them. On a completely unrelated note, also 20 years ago, I started to uh, study quantum cryptography. I was in a lab in Montreal with uh, the, the, my director, Gilles Brassard, who uh, co-invented quantum key distribution and quantum teleportation. So it was a cool, effervescent uh, area of study. And we were studying um, how to use quantum mechanics uh, properties, such as entanglement and superposition, to build computers that could do things that uh, conventional computers could not do. So you could take a, a normal bit, transform it into a quantum bit that can be like Schrodinger's cat, both dead and alive at the same time. So it could be both zero and one at the same time and be able to have some intrinsic parallelism in your algorithms. And you were able to do a lot of stuff that you couldn't do. It was great and fun math to do on paper, but uh, in real life, you know, I, a lot of us thought it would be science fiction for a very long time. So I decided to move on, get a real job as a crypto engineer. Uh, but now things are a little bit different 20 years later. There's a lot of investment being poured in this field. And you can just do, a, I don't have headlines anymore because you just do a web search every week and it's different. There are literally at least a million dollar of investment. No, seriously, it's like a billions of dollar uh, around the planet, uh, in the US, in China, in the UK. And I work at Microsoft Research, and I have colleagues down the hall that are building uh, actual quantum chips, topological qubits, and they build the hardware to that. And I have some other, another set of colleagues down on the other side of the hall who are building software they just released last year, Visual Studio Extensions to implement quantum uh, computing algorithms, so a quantum development kit. Right now it's simulated you know, in the cloud or on your computer, but once these things are ready, you can just go and re release it. And these guys are, are they're really lucky. They play with the coolest machines, and I mean that in the literal sense, because these machines need to be cooled down at 0.4 Kelvin to operate. So they are literally the coolest machines you'll ever see. It's <laughs> colder than deep, deep space. Um, so this is all the promises to be a great revolution for the field of computing and information theory, although there's a little problem. And it is, this is really bad news for cryptography because ironically, the two the most, the most popular quantum algorithms also used to break cryptography. And the first one is uh, by Peter Shore. It was... Uh, well, invented uh, many years ago, and it, it can be used to uh, factor and, and find a discrete logarithm of, of numbers, which breaks, respectively, RSA and uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange or and DSA algorithm, and the elliptic curve variants of these. Um, the other one is called the Grover, has a lesser impact because it's used. To, uh, to speed up database search and to brute force. It can be used to brute force uh, hash functions and, and block ciphers. But we can just double the sizes of these, uh, of these primitives and we're fine. So sure is really a big problem. In fact, it breaks, you know, some people say most. I, I would 
rather say, all the public key cryptography that we use today on the internet, because uh, RSA and, and the elliptic curve uh, discrete log uh, variants are, are effectively used by everybody. And that means it breaks uh, TLS, so all the HTTPS protocols. It breaks your favorite uh, uh, communication uh, protocols, such as Signal. It breaks SSH, and also breaks all your Bitcoins, and your certificates, and your software update channels. So it's really a big risk if the quantum computer comes up today. Well, okay, so we don't have quantum computers today, so what does it mean, and why, why do we care? Well, we care because of these guys, and now that they realize they cannot make money from stealing underpants, some of them uh, found another way to uh, potentially profit from that. So one risk that attackers can do is just steal ciphertext, collect ciphertext, record TLS sessions, record signal sessions, and just wait. And you wait until a quantum computer arrives, and then you can just decrypt all of that, and, and there you go. So you, uh, you can get access to this. The question is, when will that be? If it's in 200 years, we don't care. But if it's in 10 years, you might have data you need to protect uh, for more than 10 years. So you, there might be some impact. And we'll, I'll, cover, I'll talk about it uh, in a few seconds. So there's a pretty consistent academic uh, consensus um, that predicts that quantum computers are not that far away. And that by 2030, uh, we might have a machine. I mean, by we, I mean somebody on the planet with, with a lot of money to build that. So it's not, you know, you don't go to Best Buy to buy your quantum computer, but all the major countries might, might have something in their labs to be able to, to break uh, the internet cryptography. And for example, uh, RSA 2048, which is a, a very used algorithm today, would take billions of years to break uh, with conventional computers and with a significantly, significantly advanced quantum computer, which would be a matter of one day or a few hours. So we need something else. We need to replace that cryptography with something else. We need what we call quantum-safe cryptography. Now, just to motivate, why am I talking about this to you today? So, because there, there is an impact and there is something that should be addressed by the security community pretty, uh, pretty soon. First, as I mentioned, there's a danger now. In your threat models, some of the data might need to be secure for longer than, um, uh, than the time until the quantum computer will show up. Second is that even when we have this new cryptography, it takes a long time to replace and, and specify it in, in the, all the standards, TLS and, and all these, these other ones. Um, also, you need to make sure what's going to happen when you replace these algorithms in your software stack. Maybe you have RSA or, or some hash functions are coded in the code base, and then when will, you'll need to change with something new. You don't want everything to crumble because the algorithms have bigger key sizes or they take longer to run. So you need to make sure you have some code agility in your software stacks. So that's the motivation of why we care about post-quantum post -quantum cryptography today, because of the time we'll need to migrate to this new generation of crypto. Fortunately, uh, the academic cryptographers on top of that, uh, along with the, the standard bodies, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. They essentially dictate what cryptography are, is used in the US, but also as a de facto standard for the world. And they, they launched in, at the end of 2017 this competition to uh, request new proposals to replace RSA and, and DSA. And they wanted new key establishments, protocols, new signature mechanisms, and they got 64 submissions. Uh, valid ones, and last week they were supposed to announce at the Real World Crypto Conference the winners that will go to round two, but unfortunately the, because of their government shutdown they were not able to do so. <laughs> so we're all very, uh, they were waiting at the end of our seats to, to know who's going to make it to round two. 
So we don't know, we're expecting the number of submissions will go from 64 to something around 20 or something like that. And these new protocols, they look very different than an RSA and DSA. They come from different families. They cannot use factoring as their base problem or elliptic curves, DF element style. So they, they come from lattices, uh, error correcting codes, uh, zero knowledge systems, multivariate uh, systems, isogenies. And some of my colleagues have been part of four of these submissions. Uh, and it's not somebody that does one thing and submit it. There's a, a lot of collaboration across academia and industry to, uh, to submit these. These are just four examples. And now, okay, so back to, uh, back to us, the security community. So what, what do I do? Okay, I, I, I don't have time to get three PhDs to understand the math to implement that and integrate it in all these protocols. Uh, I was personally tasked to try some of these algorithms into TLS OpenSSL, and it took a very long time to try one, and then you need to try the next one, looks different. So that's why we joined this effort uh, that kind of popped up uh, with a few partners called the Open Quantum Safe Project. And the goal is to uh, provide a, a C library, a common framework in which that exposes a common API in which you plug in your post-quantum schemes. And there's two flavors. There's a master branch where we care more about quality, and uh, there's another one, the NIST branch, that just try to take all the proposals, be able to compare them. Um, we also ship uh, two integrations, two forks of OpenSSL and OpenSSH, in which we integrated this post-quantum crypto. And we support TLS 1.2 and 1.3. And uh, we also are working on language wrappers, uh, Python, Java, C Sharp. So if you're interested to, uh, to play with this, uh, I encourage you to go to the uh, website, opensafe.org, and then you'll be able to uh, play with all this software stack. As an example, that's uh, some work we've done. So we, to integrate into TLS, um, TLS 1.3 just came out, and it's, uh, the key derivation function is really a, a Nicely, uh, uh, nicely isolated, so we uh, we can just modify the key share message in this case. Be able to uh, plug in a post quantum algorithm to negotiate the key exchange. It works very nicely. That's for the key exchange part. One uh, one thing we um, we also support in there that's uh, significant is uh, what we call a hybrid mode, because even if you're fully on board of the post quantum train, you don't want to take an algorithm and just migrate to it tomorrow. Uh, we don't know if these algorithms will be uh, unbroken in 10 years because cryptography systems need a lot of, uh, uh, we, we need many eyes, many pair of eyes, look at it for many years to have some confidence. So for the foreseeable future, we envision these algorithms be used in conjunctions with classical schemes. So you would have your RSA key exchange, and in parallel, you can have a post-quantum one, and then you mix the results to do a, a key derivation in TLS. So you want to have the safety of the conventional cryptography protocols along with the, the, the security blanket of the post-quantum one that we're developing. So um, there are many flavors of these post-quantum schemes. Some of them are, are the huge keys, you know, like one, meg, one megabyte uh, key. Uh, some are very slow. Some are, uh, some are, are very efficient, but uh, less secure. So it's good to try them out. And that's part of the experiment that we're doing. And in particular, we're, we were happy to see that uh, practically, the post-quantum cryptography doesn't have a, a, a negative impact. Uh, on the contrary, if we compare with the orange line, which is uh, ECDHE on the, on the left side, ECDHE for the key exchange with the P256 curve, which is uh, kind of the best in class key exchange today. If you compare it with a, a lattice scheme, which are pretty efficient, the New Hope one on top, we get similar performance, almost 200 uh, transaction per second. And if we run it in a hybrid mode with the P256 uh, curve with the new HOPE system, that's the first line, then we just lose a, a few connections per second, like 5 
So we get this, this great second layer of protection for a very cheap price because uh, a lot of the protocol negotiation of the TLS takes a lot of the time and the crypto itself uh, kind of disappears in this uh, performance results. And we see similar results for signature scheme, the authentication, the X509 certificate validation and all that. So, and these are pretty preliminary results. Uh, these uh, crypto algorithms are gonna get optimized both algorithmically, algorithmically and, and in implementation. So these figures can only get better. Uh, okay, I, I don't wanna spend too much time on this because uh, essentially we have, uh, we did the same thing for SSH, different protocol but very similar in flavor as TLS. One other project we did, uh, which is kind of interesting, is uh, developing a kind of uh, forking OpenVPN to integrate post-quantum cryptography. Because there's a big class of software, uh, legacy software that will never, never be updated. And so what happens when this conventional crypto gets broken? Well, what you can do is tunnel it into a, a quantum safe uh, VPN. Therefore, without changing the application, you can get the safety uh, provided by these new algorithms. So it's very straightforward to understand what's going on in concept. And if you're interested in that and, and play with it, we implemented it with a Raspberry Pi access point, which our devices would connect to and then have a tunnel with our, our cloud so that uh, we get quantum safe protection there. We also uh, did some integrations in an HSM just to, to see and, and these are just exercises to say, okay, this new crypto, is there something surprising? And the answer is no, it's just a different algorithm than RSA and elliptic curve. So we just get down to it, implement it, it works. So it's, it's, uh, it gives us good uh, experience and confidence in these schemes. So that was the, for a picnic scheme uh, in particular, which is a signature based on zero knowledge and, and block ciphers. Okay, so, um, I will um, just give you a little now demo. Um, these, uh, I'm gonna do an OpenSSL connection, now a TLS connection 1.3 from uh, console to console. It's very small, I apologize. What I'm gonna do now is uh, generate a post-quantum certificate, a hybrid certificate with a Q-Tesla, uh, and a Q-Tesla, which is a lattice scheme, and the EC uh, DSA-256 certificate. And the goal here is just to show you that it's a boring OpenSSL, but if you know OpenSSL, it's the same. Everything you are used to do to uh, generate certificates and run a TLS session, nothing changes. So uh, that's the point. <laughs> that we, it's an easy connection, or easy to play with that. Now I'm just launching a server with that certificate and using TLS3 and in the other console. I'm just gonna launch a client and for the key exchange, I will use uh, ECDHE P256 in conjunction with the Frodo um, algorithm, which is also a lattice scheme. So these are the typically the most efficient way the ones. And it just works, it just sends a certificate. It has a dual key in this case and we can see if you're sitting very close, that uh, it's the key exchange and, and the signature we're using, the hybrid mode with post-quantum and the classical. So that means that if it's secure today, you run this, you're still secure, and if somebody has a quantum computer and recorded that and tries to break it in 10 years, won't be able to because it was protected by a, a cipher that's unbreak or unknown to be broken on a quantum computer. So, um, call to action to the security community is that if you, you're using or developing applications or services that use cryptography, you might wanna start thinking about post-quantum uh, transition. That doesn't mean change today, but what, what do you need to do? Start thinking about it, because in six, seven years, there's gonna be new standards to be implemented, uh, new NIST standards. Um, First thing to do today, the exercise, is to make sure your crypto is agile, that you're able to switch. Maybe you were able to switch from RSA to elliptic curve you know, five years ago, so make sure you still have this agility to change to post-quantum uh, when the time comes, so you're not surprised if there's bad news that in three years 
spoof, we learn news, uh, news report that quantum computer exists. And also, if you want to be even more proactive than that, you can start uh, using hybrid uh, post-quantum crypto there and to get the protection from, uh, to future-proof your, your communications today or use a post-quantum VPN today that, that would also give you that. So that was the presentation, and uh, hopefully we can get, put these guys out of business for good and uh, keep the data safe. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's time for questions or sorry. Oh, uh, well, for somebody walk to the mic. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, uh, awesome presentation. Thank you. Uh, what construction are you using to safely compose classical primitives with quantum safe primitives? So, what construction we're using to compose? You're asking hey. which, uh, which, what do we use to, uh, to combine the keys or uh, post quantum? Yeah, what, what is this? Can yeah. you guys? Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So it, it's really protocol specific. Like in TLS, there's already this concept in the key derivation to have multiple steps. So all this gets uh, ashed in the key derivation to produce the, uh, for example, the AES symmetric key. So this is just input to the key derivation uh, that will that will that for, for the symmetric algorithm you'll use for the TLS connection. So for example, TLS 1.3 already has this concept of having multiple steps to generate that. So with the post-quantum one is just a step. There's already this concept right now for pre-exchange keys that you can mix with a new uh, ECDH secret. So it's the same process. And other ones for the, the signatures, we just double sign the data. Like, so there's two signatures and both need to be valid for the cert signing to be valid, for example. So it's application specific, but yeah, we make sure it's secure in each case. And then uh, second question. So uh, seeing this applied is fantastic and awesome. Thank you. Um, seeing it in forks is nice, but uh, seeing it upstream would be better. Is there something that you're blocked on for merging this stuff into SSH or SSL or whatever? Um, at, well, like yeah, so NIST, um, NIST yeah. standardization or something, or no? But it's a, a lot of people we've talked with people in the TLS uh, working group, and a lot of them are waiting for the NIST standardization effort to be completed to adopt anything. But they're really happy about our experimentation with this stuff. And we've seen, you know, some so Google made public announcements and Cloudflare recently that they are making public experiments with that stuff. And so we might see industry publishing or using something before the standards are done. But you know, so it's. It's very early days for everybody. That's the, the answer. That, that's why it's not out there yet. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Hi. Uh, without access to quantum computers now, how, what gives you confidence that these solutions are going to work in the future? Yeah, so uh, without, I don't know if it's <laughs> recorded in the mic there, but the question is, uh, without access to a quantum computer, what makes us believe that nobody can break that. So you don't need a quantum computer to break this. It's all on paper. We don't have the quantum computer, but we break RSA with it. So it's mathematically, we know what the quantum computer can do. So we're able to break RSA and ECDSA or DSA. So we just don't know how to break these new schemes uh, with a quantum computer. So a lot of the NIST competition, there's a lot of quantum cryptanalysis. So given the power and the toolbox of a quantum computer, can we break this? And it's gonna be five, seven years of all the in academia trying to do just that. The same way we don't know RSA, maybe RSA is broken by a normal computer today, we just don't know. It's just, you cannot prove that any of these are unbreakable. You can just say, we've looked at it for 20 years and nobody knows how to break it. It's gonna be the same arguments on the quantum side, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll be around if you have more questions afterwards. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail on the implementation of uh, like the, the what the hybrid uh, sorry hybrid implementation is for is it just hey do you have quantum implementation done so we're going to use that instead yeah, okay. if you don't then so it's just more details about hybrid implementation so first first all of that nothing uses a quantum computer to do this crypto so this is normal crypto we just believe that a quantum computer will not be able to break it so the hybrid mode is just we run this new one, and we run the other one, and we just combine the results. The same way you could run RSA and, and ECDH in parallel and combine the results if you 
don't care. So it's just, and you can run 10 of them in parallel and combine the results just as a kind of onion to make sure you're safe, so. Thank you. Thank you.